All right, hey guys, and uh, welcome to a new video on the Octatrack. Um, I know it's been a little while, so um, just wanted to dive right in and make something new. And I finally found something that I want to talk about. Um, I've been pretty busy uh, just kind of working on composing projects and uh, playing some shows here in L.A., and um, I haven't really had a chance to uh, to use the Octatrack. I think one thing that's important to remember is that you don't have to use everything that you have for every project you have. Um, it can be really helpful for your mind to separate out, for example, using Ableton and using the Octatrack, um, and also not trying to learn too much at the same time that you're actually trying to execute something that you already know how to do, um, to sort of set aside time uh, for each of those uh, activities separately. And um, that's a bit of a personal ramble, but um, I think it's important because that's where I've uh, found myself today with, um, with this lesson, which is about uh, volume and gain staging. And uh, at first glance, this seems like a pretty uh, boring subject, um, and it is to some degree, but um, I picked it because having spent some time away from the Octatrack, I was really trying to think about like what are the things that... Um, uh, that I f that I meet resistance with internally when I'm using the Octatrack, and one of those is not fully understanding um, really basic concepts about the Octatrack. For example, where to control volume, where to control uh, you know crossfading and things like that. And I think those things can really get in the way when you actually think about um, using the Octatrack in a creative way. Um, if you don't have those basics down, then oftentimes um, it, it seems like this really difficult to comprehend. Um, tool. So I decided to uh, take some time to look through the menu, um, to command F, uh, the word volume, and to just find out all the different ways that volume can be controlled within the Octatrack. And I've actually come out with a lot more understanding, and hopefully I can transfer that understanding to you guys. So um, let's start at the um, most macro level, which is um, the mix page. And this is where you can control your cue, uh, your main volume, and I'll just play something here. So this is just to indicate that something's playing. Um, but uh, So essentially what I have here is um, we have a main and a cue. And um, when we get started, uh, one thing to remember is that most of the gain options within the Octatrack um, operate the same way, in the sense that uh, going plus 63 adds 12 dB of boost, and going minus 64, uh, which is the, m the lowest level that you can reach, uh, mutes the signal completely. And this, uh, this is applicable to um, most of the situations where you can boost the signal. It goes from muting to um, plus 12 dB. So um, at the macro level, we have uh, main, which you can boost. Um, and this, this function is shared. Um, there's a second way you can do it from this menu, which is by holding function. And you can actually see the main boost right here. Um, Q boosts the Q signal. And this is actually separate from the headphone volume signal. Because this is for your headphones, but it doesn't actually affect the, um, the Q level, which is actually coming out of here. Um, on the other hand, boosting the Q will, in fact, increase the level that you hear through your headphones, because your headphones default to um, Q. Um, lastly, on this page, we have uh, Direct. And Direct is something that I don't use very often, but I've been um, contemplating it this time around, having spent some time away from the Octatrack. Um, because the menu talks about how um, using direct in, and uh, I have, so you'll see, uh, this is under CD, which means that inputs C and D are being sent uh, through the Octatrack, um, and you can hear it. Yeah, and you can hear it, um, but it's not actually playing through any one of these tracks. So this is an alternative to creating a through track where um, essentially a similar thing happens. The only difference being that you get your own LFOs, your FX blocks. Um, you can control it a little bit more in depth. Um, but with this, if I have too many tracks already set up and I don't want to uh, use up a track for through, I can send an input directly through the um, 
the Octatrack. And in fact, uh, it does get affected by master um, effects. So if I have a track like the master track here, um, I can actually hear that the effects work. Another good use for the um, direct input is uh, a effect send. And um, that actually kind of uses up a little bit of, uh, of hardware ins and outs that um, you might not be willing to sacrifice. But if you use your cue out um, to send as, a, as an effect send, and then you, s you basically have it plugged into like an effects processor or um, a guitar pedal or something, you can send that back into input CD and set it up as 100% wet on your effects. And then um, once you have this going in, you can set it up as a direct, and then you can control it externally. Um, and that'll give you a really quick um, way to use effects externally. All right, so now that I've uh, talked about the mix page a little bit, um, I think it's helpful to move on to the track-by-track -track ways of controlling volume. So um, there's a few primary ways that you can affect the level of the source that you're working with. And um, I'm not going to go into too much detail as to the source inputs. Um, suffice it to say that when you have a sample, you can affect the gain within the audio editor. Um, the wavelength itself has a, a maximum and minimum gain, um, which you can affect through the edit page, going down to normalize or selection plus 3 dB, stuff like that. Um, but then depending on what machine you're working with, I mean, through has its own input, pickup has its own uh, gain and boost and stuff. All that stuff aside, um, once you have it within the macro track level, um, there are a few ways to affect the level of your sound. And the primary one is using this level knob. Um, every track has one. Um, it's very accessible. It's going to be your go-to for um, minor balancing changes. But I would also recommend uh, considering the volume knob because the volume knob is much more flexible than the level knob, I find. Um, partly because you can actually boost the signal um, if it's quiet. And uh, because when you uh, affect scenes, when you use scenes to change your levels, um, the level uh, knob only has two options, minimum and maximum. And this is so that you can have really convenient and fast ways to crossfade between tracks. So say I have this track, it's not playing. All right. I have this track here, which is kind of like a quieter, slowed down version of this track. And I want to create a quick crossfade. So I say um, in A, this is max, this is min. And then in B, this is max, this is min. Oh, oh right. Right. So that's really helpful um, for quick crossfades between tracks. But when it comes to changing the gain of a track without completely muting it, um, I find that the volume knob is much more versatile because you can actually set specific values. So if I want this to go quieter for my next scene, um, but I want to bring up track two at the same time. You can still hear it in the background. Additionally, you'll notice that when I hold down the scene button, this uh, second knob pops up. And this actually creates a min-max for this volume uh, knob. Now, why would they give you this option? Well, because in the uh, signal chain here, um, the level knob actually affects the whole signal after it's been processed through the LFO, the amp, the effects, blocks one and two. On the other hand, the volume crossfade, or the min-max knob here, uh, affects the level of the signal at the amp stage. And um, this, in turn, gets affected by the LFO, by the effects, before it reaches the level stage. And the reason this is important, and I will demonstrate that, is because 
um, volume at this level uh, can drastically change the way that something sounds when it gets processed through uh, one of your effects. So one of the biggest ones that I've found is distortion. And um, let's listen to the way this distortion sounds. If I boost the signal a little bit. Right, so you can hear it kind of crunching there. Now if I reduce the volume, you'll notice that at lower levels, uh, not as much happens. And that's because distortion, it distortion basically enhances the crunch that naturally happens from uh, gain boosts. But once it gets quieter, not as much is going on. Other effects that do this or might um, be affected in similar ways are uh, certain reverbs. Um, compressor will definitely be affected because the threshold isn't being reached, so nothing's getting squashed. Um, so that's why it does make a difference to use the volume here as opposed to the level there. And uh, another way of demonstrating this is by using the LFO. So um, I have my LFO set up uh, sorry, I'm jumping around a lot. I have my LFO set up to affect the volume knob in the amp section. And I'm going to set it to saw so that it's going up. And I'm going to basically set the speed and timing so that it happens every quarter note. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with sidechain, this um, is what I've found to be the easiest way to create uh, artificial sidechain within the Octatrack. Um, if I increase the depth, and I'll turn off the distortion. I can really get it to sound like uh, it's pumping. Um, and I'll add a kick to demonstrate that further. But, um, and I'll mute the kick now, but one thing that's important to know is that when you have the volume being affected, and the distortion is applied to it after the fact. You'll notice that the distortion is more drastic as it gets louder. And um, this to me is much more dynamic than if you were to have some sort of a sidechain effect happening on the macro level. So um, just something to keep in mind creatively when you're working on something and uh, different little changes that you can make to the volume can affect the actual sound as opposed to using the level here which only affects the um, the actual level of the signal. Um, another thing to keep in mind with LFOs um, is that depending on what um, signal you're working with, um, you can only work to the ceiling of the parameter that you're affecting. So for example, if I boost the volume all the way to 63 and I have my saw or my, my wave here, which is um, going upwards, then um, essentially it's not going to do anything because the max it's already reached the maximum. And since this wave naturally goes up, um, you'll hear that. Hold on. Unless it's actually below and above. Well, in any case, Basically, what I'm trying to say is that there isn't is that it will not get any louder than maximum 63. So if you have something set to this, and the depth is set to full, it's not going to get any louder uh, than plus 12, and it's not going to get any quieter than muted, which isn't even possible. Okay. Um, a couple last little bonus things that I wanted to cover um, real quick is within the mix menu, there's another thing that you can affect with regards to scenes. So um, while I'm in the mix menu and I hold down a scene, um, the direct turns into X direct. And uh, essentially this works like um, X level and X volume where you can um, set min and max on these. And this can create 
a cross fade or a fade out of an external signal. So if I have a signal like that, it'll go away once I turn this. Additionally, um, in the project settings, you can go to metronome and you can set uh, not only the time signature of the metronome, but you can set pre-roll for recordings, you can set cue volume, which is helpful uh, if you think it's too loud. You can set main volume so that you actually get some signal to the main volume. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, it's something I didn't know until I read the menu this morning. And uh, this is super helpful. Uh, you can make it tonal. So let's actually hear what it sounds like. You can make it a click or make it a tone and you can choose what the tone actually is. Or you can just make it one of these kind of like old school clicks. Figured I'd have to cover that if I'm talking about volumes. So um, so that's pretty much all of the ways that you can affect volume before you reach uh, the source, which is the first, um, the first way to affect it. But I want to separate that into a second video um, because I'm already running kind of long. So, um, so yeah, um, hopefully this clears up some of the confusion uh, when you're playing something and nothing's coming out. Um, that is, uh, oh, one more thing. Something that I read in the manual. If you hold down setup and you go to these two, don't turn these knobs to try to affect the input of A, B, and C, D, unless you're using this as a pickup machine. This only applies to monitoring when you have a pickup machine in that track. Um, that's something that I did not know and I kept trying to use it. Does not work unless it's a pickup machine. So, um, so yeah, aside from that, uh, those are the ways that I am aware of. Um, if anybody thinks of any that I haven't thought of, uh, feel free to mention them in the comments and I'll try to make like a makeup video or something. My next video will be about uh, the levels with regards to a source. So if you have a through machine, how you can affect the levels. If you have a sample, um, where to affect the levels and what things to watch out for. Um, I know it's a little dry. Um, it's not as fun as some of the other videos, but um, this is some of the stuff that I think is the main foundation for using the Octatrack effectively. You don't want to know, uh, you don't want to be confused about what's going on if you're performing a live show um, and something's too loud or something's starting to clip or getting distorted and you have no way of troubleshooting that. So, um, so I think if you can get these fundamentals down and, um, and sort of create a system for yourself that works um, that's the first step to being confident in your use. Um, it kind of reminds me of, I've been like sort of taking these online drawing classes and you start out just drawing lines and shapes and it's about building up that confidence so that you don't have to think about, um, troubleshooting when you're trying to be creative. Um, so yeah, uh, best of luck to you guys and, uh, until next time. Thanks for watching.